Let me invite you to take your Bibles, open to Psalm 23 as we look in this message series entitled Sheepology, looking at the dynamic of a relationship between a shepherd and sheep, between a child of God and our Savior. Psalm 23 is a very rich psalm. It is a psalm that is a confession of confidence, of confidence in the Lord. David writes these words as a testimony of trust. And Psalm 23, for many of us, has become a very uh, familiar but very meaningful psalm. And I want you to give your attention again to the words of Psalm 23, and I invite you to say them with me out loud. Let's begin in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we have mentioned before, this is a psalm that encourages great trust and great confidence in the shepherd. It contains no plea, no request, no prayer, just simply acknowledging who the Lord is in his life. We began this series talking about why we need a shepherd in the first place and looked at how we are are prone to wander as sheep. Uh, The Bible says we like sheep have gone astray, every one of us to our own way. It's a reminder that left to ourselves, we are prone to wander. But in the ministry of the Lord, he begins to work in our lives. And one of the ministries of the Lord is the ministry of restoration. What does it say here in the scripture? He restores our soul. He restores our soul. Last week when we came together, we looked at that first aspect of those that are in need of restoration, those who need their souls restored by the shepherd. Those that are being restored last week we talked about are those who have fallen down. Those that have fallen down, these are those who are are struggling on the path. You love the Lord. You want to follow the Lord. You're walking with the Lord, and yet you come across one of those days, one of those circumstances, one of those situations, maybe even a season of life where you find yourself wrestling, waiting on the Lord. You're finding yourself filled with a sense of sorrow and struggle. You you want to be following faithfully, but whatever the circumstance or situation, you find yourself falling down, and, and you may find yourself like a sheep that is cast. And as that sheep that is cast, you find yourself in need of the shepherd to take you and to steady you and turn you right side and allow you to follow faithfully. Well, today we're going to give our attention to another group of sheep, and these are the sheep that have fallen away. They're different from the ones that have simply fallen down. Those that have fallen down, they are those that are struggling on the path. Those that are falling away are those who are straying from the path. Those that are straying from the path, and and this is a different group altogether, and One of the things that I will tell you as we look at this particular message and ministry of the Lord's restoration, this message today is less pleasant, but it's much needed. It's a message about the discipline of God and how God uses discipline in our lives. And and I I would be willing to say that that, uh, no church member ever walks up to a pastor after he preaches on the discipline of God and says, Pastor, that's in your top ten. Nobody just readily wants to resonate with a message that deals with discipline. But yet there are sheep that are in the flock. And sheep that are in the flock that began to stray from the shepherd. 
Now, it's interesting for us to remind ourselves that these are sheep that belong to the shepherd. They're in the flock of the shepherd. Remember what David says. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. There is already a relationship there between shepherd and sheep. So this is a message today when we talk about those that are are straying from God's path, that are straying from the paths of righteousness. We're not talking about individuals here who are losing their salvation. This is not a passage where people are, are forfeiting their salvation. When you belong to the shepherd, you belong to the shepherd. Jesus says in John chapter 10 and verse 28, Jesus says, and he's talking about the people of God, talking about the family of God, talking about the saved who belong to the flock of God. Jesus says this, he says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. When you are a shepherd and you are leading your sheep, there are going to be many times that there are going to be adversaries or predators that are waiting on the prowl and yet Jesus speaking as the good shepherd the great shepherd the chief shepherd Jesus says there is nothing that can snatch them out of my hands it's good to be in the hands of this shepherd when you belong to God you belong to God when you belong to the shepherd you belong to the shepherd and so this isn't a conversation about losing your salvation or forfeiting your salvation Jesus says it elsewhere in John chapter 6, verse 39. He says, and this is the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the heavenly father, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Let me tell you something, child of God. If you have placed your faith in the grace gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've placed your faith in this Savior, this shepherd, if you have received his gift of grace, if you have been forgiven of your sins, then the Bible says that Jesus Christ will lose not one of those who have been saved and that will be raised on the last day. And so understanding when you are in the hands of this shepherd, you are in good, good hands. However, we also need to be reminded that no Christian should think that he is too strong or she is too strong not to stumble not to stray we never need to look at ourselves and say i'm not like the other sheep i'm always faithful to follow the shepherd i'm not like the rest of the flock i'm always faithful to the shepherd i'm not one that's going to go wayward i'm going to be faithful to the shepherd let us not ever put ourselves in a position to say that we are a sheep that can never go astray no christian should assume that he is too strong or she is too strong to to stumble or to stray first corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 the bible says so if you think you are standing firm be careful that you don't fall first corinthians 10 12 so if you think you are standing firm be careful that you don't fall Well, we may ask this question, what is it that causes sheep to stray anyway? Is there anything that sheep that go wayward have in common? Is there anything about a sheep that strays that they have in common with other sheep that strays? Now, there can be a lot of reasons that a sheep may go astray, but I want to give you two that they all have in common. The first one is this, sheep stray when they fail to keep their eyes on the shepherd. Sheep will stray when they fail to keep their eyes on the shepherd. It's important for us to always fix our eyes on Jesus. When we take our eyes off of the shepherd, it's easy for us to go astray. When you take your eyes, when you take your eyes away from the one that you are to follow, There are consequences. I learned this the hard way. About 20 years ago, when when I was a younger pastor, I had been asked to uh, fly out to Breckenridge, Colorado and do a ski retreat 
for a church out of Texas. They had all of their high school students there. They had invited me out to be the speaker. And, and uh, part of the opportunity was to speak in the morning, speak in the evening, and get to snow ski during the day. I thought, I'll suffer for Jesus. I'll go to Breckenridge for you. And so I got invited, and I went out there. And uh, I had done quite a bit of snow skiing in my life in a lot of different places, really enjoyed it. I was younger, a little more flexible back then. And so went out on the ski course and everything, and... Uh, we were going, and there were several of us. A lot of them haven't been a lot, but several of us had. And so we were moving up. We went to the Double Black Diamonds. If you know anything about that, that's one of the more difficult terrains. And so I was pretty excited about that. We get up there, and I'm talking to one of the few individuals that would also do Double Black. And he says, you know what? I've been out here several times. Just follow me. Great. Not a problem. Not a problem at all. And so we're sitting there. We're talking, and he's got on his you know, his outfit there and his overalls and his red coat and he's got his goggles going on and I'm getting ready to take off. And so I'm just kind of adjusting. He starts down the hill, I get adjusted and I start to take off down the hill. And so we're skiing, everything's going well. And I've just, I've got my eyes fixed on the man in the red coat. We begin going and we're following the skiing thing. Next thing I know, he kind of veers off towards, you know, off towards the left, a little bit off the path. And I'm like, great, we're going to go this way. We're going to go fine. We just keep skiing. It looked a little different. I noticed there's only the two of us now, right? And we're going down through this place. And then, as God is my witness, we're going down this alley where all of these little cabins or chalets are built alongside kind of this snow alley. And then he just skis right over into one of those chalets. <laughs> Not my guy. <laughs> Wrong red coat. I had literally skied into residential area. As God is my witness, I had to board a bus and be taken back. You know what happened? I took my eyes, even for a moment, off of the one I was supposed to follow. There can be consequences for those that go astray. It's easy to see that sheep can go astray when they fail to keep their eyes on the shepherd. Sheep also stray when they fail to follow in close proximity of the shepherd. Now here's a good word. We have too many Christians that want to be disciples at a distance. And when you say, I'm going to live my life, I love Jesus, and you know Jesus is my Savior, but you want to follow him at a distance, if you are not wanting to walk in close proximity with your Lord, be careful, you can go astray. Sheep tend to get in trouble, tend to go wayward, off the path, when they fail to keep their eyes on the shepherd and they fail to follow in close proximity to the shepherd. So for all of us, let us just consider for a moment, are we walking closely with the Lord? Or are we simply following at a distance? The first thing I want you to take away from this message today is this, number one, that restoring wayward ones is of great concern to God. Restoring wayward ones is of great concern to God. How many of you all are familiar with the nursery rhyme about Little Bo Peep? Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them. Leave them alone. They'll come home wagging their tails behind them. No offense to Little Bo Peep, but she ought to be fired. I mean, that's not a great shepherd. She just simply took the attitude, well, I'll just leave them out there and they'll come home and they'll be joyful about it. There's something here in that nursery rhyme that we remember and we think, oh, that's nice and sweet. But the fact is, is she's a terrible shepherd. Jesus is a different kind of shepherd. He says in Matthew chapter 18 in verse 12, what do you think 
If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains to go in search of the one that went astray? This is a shepherd that cares about his flock. Now, don't miss this. This is a shepherd who cares about every sheep in the flock. The imagery that's given here of Jesus as a shepherd reminds us that even when one of his sheep goes wayward, it's of great concern to him. It's of great concern to him. As a matter of fact, I want you to understand that Jesus cares just as much for the backslidden sheep as he does for the one that is faithfully following behind him. The Bible talks about how they rejoice when that sheep is found. Jesus has this, as a shepherd, he has a heart for every individual sheep. And the reality is, is that there are going to be times, if you've walked with the Lord for a number of years, there's going to be times in your life that you are not walking with the Lord as closely as you once did. Maybe you sit here and think about that for a moment. Are you walking as closely with the Lord? Are you growing in that relationship? Are you pursuing him, seeking him, following him, desiring to grow in that relationship of shepherd and sheep? And here's what I want to tell you. Many times what happens is people walk along, they begin to just backslide. They begin to drift. They begin to stray from the shepherd. And yet even then, Jesus seeks to restore. He seeks to be able to restore the wayward ones that have gone astray. So number one, restoring wayward ones is of great concern to God. Number two, God's restoring ministry is sometimes accompanied with correction. God's restoring ministry is sometimes accompanied with correction. Roy Gustafson, who has been a host that has led a number of tours to the Holy Land, uh, he tells in his book, entitled In His Hand, that on one of his visits on the road down from Jerusalem through the Judean wilderness down towards Jericho, his party, his group, they, they met a shepherd who was shepherding and moving his sheep in the opposite direction. It was coming by him. And Roy was saying that his tour guide had said, hey, listen, did you see that shepherd carrying that sheep, that sheep that had a bandage on its leg. They said, yeah, we all saw that. That's kind of sweet. He said, yeah, the shepherd broke that leg. He said, the shepherd broke that leg. That was a, uh, a sheep that was a very independent spirit. It was a sheep that was always wandering off. And in the process, it was always getting into trouble. It was a sheep that would uh, be moving in its own. And this shepherd broke the leg of that sheep. He said, so in order to cure that sheep of its self-willed ways, he said, in order to cure that, he said, the shepherd broke its leg, but then he mended it. He hand-fed it. And then he carried that sheep until the sheep was made whole. Nobody likes to consider the correction of God in their life. In fact, I don't know any of us that say, I absolutely love to be corrected or I love to be disciplined. And here's the reality. When God disciplines you, you are actually blessed because you know that you have a shepherd you belong to who cares enough about you to restore you and to do whatever it takes. In the book of Job, chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, uh, the Bible says, Blessed is the man whom God corrects. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty, for he wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, but his hands 
also heal. That God cares about you enough to correct you, to discipline you when you go astray. Says a great deal about the nature of this shepherd. One of the things you need to understand is that correction is painful. Correction is painful. None of us readily desire to be corrected. None of us readily run to being disciplined. We, we don't like it. We don't want it in our lives, if we're honest. But yet correction is because it's painful. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11, the Bible says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Can I get an amen? When you are under the correcting hand of God, understand it's not a pleasant experience. It is a painful experience. It is a disruptive experience. Consider that it's like a surgeon. When you come in and, and you have a fracture of the bone and you are in pain because this, this bone is no longer right. It has been fractured. It has been broken. And the surgeon tells you, hey, listen, what we need to do is we need to snap this bone back into place. And you're like, ah, morphine. <laughs> and he's like, no, listen, we're, we're, it's going to hurt, but it's going to heal. It's going to hurt, but it's going to heal. We're, it's going to hurt for that moment. Listen, it's going to hurt for that moment. But you're going to find out on the other side of that being restored, that being set right, you're going to find it is not as painful as it was when it was fractured, when it was broken. And so the surgeon is willing to reset that at a level of pain so you can heal and be restored. The Lord does the same. There are times when your relationship with him, it is fractured because of your waywardness. And God says, listen, it's going to hurt, but I need to restore this. I need to set it back in place. And so God brings about that ministry of restoration. Correction is painful. When I was growing up and being corrected and disciplined at the hands of my, uh, my father and my mother, my dad always said something that I just never really believed. You know where I'm going with this? He said, now son, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And I started speaking in tongues and said, baloney. I know how this works. Correction is it's painful. But you know, as, as, a, uh, as I matured, as I grew up, and even as a parent of kids of my own, do you know how many times I've repeated that same phrase? It does not bring God joy to bring pain. It does bring him joy to bring about restoration. And that correction that he brings is painful. But listen, that correction is also purposeful. By the way, let me say this. I would rather have a shepherd who is willing to correct. I would rather have a shepherd that is willing to correct me rather than neglect me. Even when it comes at a pain. Why? Because, because this correction is also purposeful. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 10, the Bible says, God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Look at this again. God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. God has a purpose behind the pain of that correction. God has a purpose behind that discipline. That is so that we may share in his holiness. David understood this. David, the author of Psalm 23, also David here in the Psalms in Psalm 119, 
he says this, he says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. He goes on to say, It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. Here's what David's saying. I don't love affliction. I don't love correction. But when you brought that into my life, Lord, when you brought that into my life as a good, good shepherd, he says, listen, here's how I benefited from that. It was good that I was afflicted. There are those times when we don't always see the goodness of that discipline there in the moment, but yet that's correctly what the Lord says. He disciplines us for our good. Hebrews 12, 11, the Bible says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those that have been trained by it, that those that have been disciplined. This is, it produces what God is doing in you, conforming you towards the image of Christ, the shepherd, your savior. God's at work doing this in your life. And when discipline is necessary, God will bring that about. Why? Why will he bring that about? Because you say, Pastor, it says it's painful. It's not pleasant at the time. It's because it'll produce that righteousness and draw you back to him. The Lord restores your soul. And that leads us to the last thought on correction. It is painful, it is purposeful, but correction is passing. Did you notice in these verses there's a theme, often it will say something like this, uh, for a little while or at the moment or at the time. It's a reminder to us that there is a temporary nature to the discipline or correction of God. God will only bring that discipline into your life for as long as it is necessary and not a moment longer. God has a purpose in mind, and when that result is achieved, you are no longer on that discipline. You find yourself in the restorative arms of your Savior, the one who wounds also heals, the one who breaks also binds up. And it's never longer than necessary to accomplish God's righteous result. Restoring wayward ones is a great concern to God. And God's restoring ministry is sometimes accompanied with correction. But number three, God's restoring ministry is always accompanied with compassion. It's always accompanied with compassion. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 30, 32. Though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. I understand that in the world that we live in today, that there is a version of Christianity where we would simply say, well, pastor, I, I just reject that that a God who loves me would, would bring things that cause me to be uncomfortable. Or I reject to think about a God who loves me that, that will bring some things that are unpleasant in my life. And I want you to know that, that that's not the testimony of the Bible. God loves you too much to believe that lie. He will bring that restoration ministry into your life. And he always does so with compassion. He cares for you. God, he deals firmly, but gently. Towards his children that have gone astray. I'm going to ask our worship team to prepare to lead us in our invitation time. And as they make their way, I want to simply say this. The heartbeat of any true child of God is to follow after the shepherd. It's to follow after the Savior. But if we're honest, 
There are times when we take our eyes off of the shepherd and we don't follow in close proximity to the shepherd. And when we do, we set ourselves up to go astray and we will be those that have fallen away. But it's there that even there that Jesus still loves you. And while you may find yourself in a season with a wandering heart, he still has an unwavering heart towards you. So don't ever get to a place where you as a child of God, you say, Pastor, I've strayed outside of the love of God. No, what I will tell you is this. Simply look around. Your Savior is pursuing you. He wants to restore your soul. He wants you to turn back towards him. That word turn back, we have a theological word for it. It's called repentance. Repentance means to to turn away and to turn away and turn toward. And that's precisely what it is. Those who are wayward, they have turned away. But God says, turn around, turn around towards me you know I don't know all of your stories but maybe just maybe you would say pastor if I'm honest I'm not walking with the Lord like I should be I'm a disciple who follows at a distance I don't always fix my eyes on Jesus and I want you to hear me very clearly he still loves you And he desires to restore your soul. And he'll do whatever it takes to bring you back. Father, I want to pray for the people in this room and the people that have joined us online. Lord, you know the audience who hears this message today. Father, I pray that you will allow us to examine our own heart. Lord, it's so easy for us at times to fall into a pattern of being backslidden. Not walking the way that we once did. Not following as faithfully as we once did. Lord, draw us back. We are those that are prone to wander. Draw us back to you. Restore our soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.